When I look back, it was Aperture that really made me fall in love with photography. To be able to replicate that three-dimensional form and the depth in the photograph was a game changer for me. It made me realise that the viewer of my photograph could see exactly what I saw through my eyes when I took the shot. This was the difference between snapshots and photographs. Aperture taught me that the lens of my camera really could do a great job of replicating what I saw through the lens of my eye. Aperture is something which doesn't actually occur inside the camera, but within your lens. The aperture blades turn and essentially create a hole which allows light into the camera. The aperture can be changed from a large hole to a small hole to control the amount of light entering the lens. It's pretty self-explanatory that a large hole lets in more light than a small hole. Aperture is measured by something called f-stops. When I was first learning, I felt it was quite appropriate that they were called f-stops, as I was frustrated trying to get my head around the numbers. A low f number is a big hole which lets in more light, and a high f number is a small hole which lets in less light. You'd expect it to be the other way around, but that's just how it is. Aperture is not just about controlling light. Something really creative is happening at the same time. These F numbers control something called depth of field. What this means is that we can control how much of our photograph stays in focus. I met this wonderful lady called Tina and her and her husband Dave have over, I think, 85 years of experience in gardening and horticulture. That's what they do for a living. I absolutely love gardening. I eat it, drink it, sleep it, I think. I spend every minute in the garden until I go to bed and then when I go to bed <laughs> I think I seem to dream about it and what I'm going to do the following day and what I'm going to, what's going to be out and I just, I just love my garden, I just love the plants, watching them grow, watching them flower and then of course the, the plants attract the wildlife so you've got the birds and the insects and you know it's just beautiful. I could photograph Tina all day long. She is fascinating to talk to. She's got so much experience and I really like to visit her and to go and walk around the gardens, take pictures of the flowers. It's constantly changing. Every time we're there, she's got something new to show me. The reason why people love our garden is, in effect, because it's divided off into lots of different garden rooms, it relates to most people's gardens. Sometimes depth of field can prove to be really useful if you have a great subject but a distracting background. What if your subject can't be moved? You may have something really interesting but you can't change its position. By selecting a large aperture, you can blur the background so it no longer distracts your eye from your main subject. When the people come to see the garden, um, they love the garden. Um, you know, because they do get ideas from it. Um, they do love the, the different plantings and the structures and the textures. And also, because I'm a bit obsessive with colour, <laughs> they do love my colour schemes and they see things and they think, gosh, I would never think of putting those two colours together. I'm going to go home and try that in my garden. And so many people come in and say, it is just such an inspirational garden. It's just lovely that they can go away with something, you know, to do in their own garden, really. Depth of field works on focus planes. If you were to imagine your image was cut up into sections from the area nearest the camera, the foreground, to the middle section, and then all the way through to the background, these would all be on a different focal plane as they are separated by distance. We can control how many of those sections we wish to keep in focus by choosing the right f-stop. If we open up our lens and use a large aperture of say 2.8, this creates a very shallow depth of field. 
So once we have chosen where the focus is going to be, anything along that plane will be in focus. Anything in the foreground and background drop out of focus very quickly. We can use this effect creatively to draw attention to certain parts of our image and also to create depth. If we were to shut down the lens to a small hole and use a small aperture of say f18, not only will that plane be in focus, but all of the foreground and all of the background also come into focus. For instance, if you were taking a portrait of somebody in their environment, you might just want to focus on the person. Well, in which case, if you did that, you would be using the shallow depth of field. But what if you wanted to include and incorporate the working environment for that person, then what you would want to do is use a wide depth of field so everything in the foreground would be in focus just as much as everything in the background would be in focus. Because this time it's not about isolating one particular part of the image, it's about keeping everything of equal importance and keeping it all in focus. And then that's where I would choose to use a wide depth of field. I've developed a style of portraiture where I'll very often use a shallow depth of field. Sometimes I like to use aperture creatively to produce interesting backgrounds. By blurring parts of the scene, I can create a beautiful coloured backdrop without taking any of the attention away from my model. One thing I do love is to get really shallow and focus just on my subject's eyes. For me, using a low aperture in my portraits makes them feel very real. The advantage of having a garden like Tina's is that you could take a model there and everywhere you look there's something different. There's more colour, there's different texture, there is always something that if you need to do a specific shoot with somebody or it would be like a default for me if you know I needed a, a good looking background I know that pretty much I can take a model there and anywhere I point the camera is going to be beautiful. If you're just starting out, one of the best places you can visit is a garden centre, a neighbour's garden, somewhere like Tina's. Just spend some time walking around, it's a lovely environment to be in. You can spend time looking at the flowers, but equally photographing them is a perfect way to start. You can practice the technique over and over again. Firstly, you're in a wonderful environment, which is forever changing throughout the seasons, there's always something different. But you can really get close up, practice those techniques, but at the same time, you can create some really beautiful pictures. And before you know it, you'll be walking around taking shots that are bordering on abstract pieces of art, which you can hang in your house. And this technique, it really will create the difference between a snapshot of what you were shooting before, just taking pictures in the garden, and something that you can hang on your wall and be really proud of.